Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. We are glad that you are here with us. My name is Gene. I'm the pastor here at Memorial. A couple of announcements for you. One announcement that you will not find in your bulletin. Uh, there will not be youth group tonight. Uh, so if you're part of the youth group, just know that you're not meeting tonight, but you will be back on your regular schedule next week. This Wednesday, March 11th, we have supper at 6. I know that we had supper at 6 like two weeks ago and went once a month and the timing doesn't work out, but it is. We're getting back on the second Wednesday of the month, so we do have it this week. Uh, if you'd like to come, if you would, please just register that in the pew pad, or you can call or email the office and let us know. Uh, but we need to get a, as good a number as we can to know how many to provide food for. Uh, the meal is hamburger steak, green beans, potato casserole, rolls, and then brownies and ice cream for dessert. Uh, so good food. Come and join us. The UMW Spring Luncheon is Saturday, March 21st at the Social Hall at 1130. Tickets are $10. You can get tickets from the Executive Committee members of the UMW or we have tickets available in the office during the week. Our Bible study, uh, Forgiveness, Finding Peace Through Letting Go, it's a book by Adam Hamilton that I'm teaching. We'll start this evening at 5 o'clock. We're doing the first chapter. I think there may still be a couple books left in the Narthex. I gave out of all that we had last week and ordered some more. Uh, if you don't get one after the service, let me know. I can order some more. Uh, I have no problem doing that. But we encourage you to, to come and join us even if you don't have a book. Uh, come and join us. Uh, if you do get a book, chapter one is short, so you'll be able to read it before this evening. Mission Kids is going on tonight from 5 to 6 as they will continue their projects. The youth are doing a mission weekend on March 20th and 21st. They'll spend the night here on Friday night and spend all day on Saturday doing mission projects throughout the Greer community. And then on Sunday, March 29th, we will have our second meeting for our congregational meeting for our forward focus process. And the United Methodist men wanted to do something to tie into that. So they are going to cook breakfast for everybody. Uh, starting at 8 a.m., if you come to the 9 o'clock service, just come a little early, get some breakfast. Uh, if you come for the congregational meeting at 10, then come a little early, get you some breakfast. The breakfast is free, but we will be accepting all donations uh, that will go towards helping children at Memorial and other children go to Asbury Hills uh, camp for the summer. So we encourage you to come, to give as you feel led, uh, and to support that ministry as well. 
You will also see our financials in the bulletin, um, and you will see that we are behind for the year. Uh, that is the amount that is given uh, versus the amount that we have spent. So uh, I want to encourage you if you're kind of behind or if uh, you can find ways to continue to help support to do that for our church. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us sing our opening hymn together, hymn number 381, Shepherd or Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Please remain standing and join me in affirming what it is that we believe with the words of the Apostles' Creed as found on page 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Our first scriptural lesson is from Psalm 121 that can be found on page 965 in your pew Bible. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We want to invite Everett Owens and his mom and dad, Samantha and John, to come and join us this morning, and Katie Jeter, our children's director. Uh, as they're coming, it's a fun day for me because I spent a couple years in Easley working with their youth group in Easley, and Samantha was one of my youth uh, in Easley, and so when she found out that I was in Greer, her and John came and started coming. Uh, they regularly attend the nine o'clock service, and she was pregnant at the time, and then we got to meet little Everett. How you doing, man? You good this morning? So I want to invite all of you to join us in the sacrament of baptism on page 39 in your hymnals. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present Everett Reed for baptism. Samantha and John, I ask you, on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. If so, say, I do. I ask you, the entire congregation, as Christ's body, the church, to reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life? And include this per child now before you in your care. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. 
In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to, sit to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and he who receives it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and be raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. You gonna come see me? Huh? What's up, man? How you doing? How you doing? There's all those people, huh? What name is given this child? Everett Reed Owens. Everett Reed. Let's get you in a better position, buddy. Oh, there we go. Everett Reed, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through the water and the Spirit, you may live a faithful life as a disciple of Christ. Amen. Everett, we're going to ask all these people. Being, oh, I just bumped you right into my microphone. That wasn't very nice to me, was it? I did that. I'm sorry. We're going to ask all these people to sing a song, and I'm going to walk you down the aisle so they can all see you. If you'll all join in singing the first hymn of Child of Blessing, Child of Promise. You just got a pretty cool deal, man. You just became part of this church. You did. So all these people are now part of your family. Yeah, and your mommy and daddy promised that you would be part of this church. And do you know what all these people promised you? Whatever you want. <laughs> they did. They promised you whatever you want or whatever you need that they will be there to help raise you to help be a part of your family. And so your family just got a lot bigger this morning. Yeah, they did. You gonna play with my microphone now? That's okay, you can do that. We are so excited to have you as part of our church now, officially, yeah. So I'm gonna hand you back to mommy and daddy because you've been really good and I don't wanna push my luck. <laughs> And we have a gift for y'all from the church and a certificate of baptism. And we are so thankful that y'all are part of our church. Thank you. Thank y'all. Y'all welcome Everett.
would invite you to join me in prayer this morning. God, we are grateful for all the beauty in life, the beauty that surrounds us each day, for new birth and new life, for the things that you have given to us, for the ways that you continue to work in our lives, even in the midst of our mess, even in the midst of a world that seems crazy, that seems out of touch. God, you are still there in the midst of it all. So we give thanks this morning. We also come to you seeking your help. Lord, there are fears in this world. Fears of virus. Fears of strife. Fears of death. Fears of all sorts of things. So God, we seek you who the one that calms our fears. The one that reminds us that you are there with us each and every step of the way. Whether it be in the mountaintop or the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, we will not fear. For you are with us. May you continue to be our healer, our comforter, our peace. And our hope. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a time now for our offering. We invite our ushers to come forward. You are invited to place your offering in the offering plate as it comes by. Or you can give electronically. There are directions on how to do so in your bulletin. We invite you to give as you feel led.
Please be seated. We're continuing our sermon series on Restored, a book by Tom Berlin, talking about being restored from the messiness of our lives and the messiness of the world around us. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead and as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You were saved by God's grace. And God has raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations that greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. You were saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. The Word of God for the people of God. When I was spent some time at Advent in Greenville, I spent about two years there as a youth director. I enjoyed my time, but I was struggling. I I loved the idea of being in a relationship, but I didn't really like the people I dated. Now, that may not sound very good, and it really wasn't very good. I was alone. I was lonely. I was living by myself. I was a youth minister and spent almost all my time with teenagers. And so I love the concept of, of having someone there and another adult, a person to lean on and love the idea of being in a relationship. But when you don't like the people that you're in a relationship with, you just leave yourself in a mess and the people you've dated in a mess as well. And so I'd created a lot of mess in my life and I began to realize this in about February or March of a year and so I ended up breaking up the girl, breaking up with the girl that I was dating and said, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of done with this for a while. I need to need to just stop. I've created enough of a mess. Well, later that summer, I wanted to, to start a U, to start a Saukahatchee in Greenville. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to be an assistant camp director. And so I called my former youth director, Neil Flowers. He was starting one in Aiken. I said, hey, can I come be your assistant camp director? He said, yeah, that's great. Now, if you're not familiar with the role of assistant camp director, I was very excited about it. The assistant camp director and the camp director drive around in air-conditioned cars all week and make sure everybody has what they need. (laughs) So people are out sweating, pouring sweat. You're like, you need water? Let me go to the store and get you some water in my air-conditioned vehicle, and I'll bring it back to you. I was excited about this. I loved working in Saukahatchee, but air conditioning for an entire week sounded great, too. If I felt like it, I could get on a roof, nail down a couple shingles, and be like, see, I helped on your house. 
And about two weeks before, Neil calls me. He goes, man, I got a great problem. I said, what is it? He said, we got a bunch of people signed up. I said, man, that's great. He goes, I got more people than I know what to do with. You need to run a house for me. And I said, whoa. The assistant camp director rides around in the car all week. That's my title. He said, yeah, well, you're going to be the assistant camp director who runs a house too. I said, fine, I'll do it. I didn't really want to. I was looking forward to my air conditioning. And he said, but I'll make it up to you. I said, okay, this better be good. He said, you can choose whatever female site leader you want. I said, what are my options? He started naming all the female adults. And I said, I don't know a single one of them. Except there was this one, the last one he named. I knew who she was. I didn't know her. Her name was Katie Fleming. Um, I knew her mama and daddy. Her daddy and her mama were both on staff there. She had dog set for my parents. Um, so we kind of knew of each other. And I said, well, give me her. I figure that she's younger and I can deal with her better than I can some of the other people that I've worked with before at Sockahatchee. And so we go and, and you know, we're, we're there the first day and I see her and I'm like, okay, I can, I can probably work with her for a week. That'll be fine. <laughs> Her impression of me at first was not very impressionable. <laughs> she was not very enthused, shall we say. I was more excited that my buddy Brandon was coming to work with me because we worked a ton of Sockahatchies together and you know, we were going to hang out that week and I was more excited about him. And so as the week came on, Katie and I began to spend more and more time together and talk more and more. And, and so by about Wednesday, we were in the kitchen and they were fixing a meal for the Salkahatchee group and her dad walks in and sees me and Katie from across the kitchen and realizes that there's a spark between the two of us. And he told me at, his, at that moment in time, the words that went through his mouth, I can't really repeat in church. They were not kind towards me. You see, I had made a mess of things. Salkahatchee in and of itself is a mess. And even in the midst of the mess that I had made in my life and the mess that I was in the midst of in Salkahatchee, God reached out and put Katie and I together. Two weeks later, I told her I loved her and 14 months later, we were married. And this summer will be 13 years together. In the midst of the mess, God is there. You see, you and I ends up in all sorts of messes. And a lot of times, what they come down to is idolatry. You and I put other things before God. I mean, that, that's really what idolatry is, is, is the things that you and I put before God. And some of those things in and of themselves are not bad. Some of us put family before God. We are called to be good sons and daughters and husbands and wives and grandchildren. We're called to be those things. But not to put those before God. Sometimes for us, we, we say that, that we work. And work becomes this thing that we do all the time because we're, we're trying to strive and get ahead. And we say it's all in good, but it really becomes an idol. Sometimes for us, it's sports or sewing or shopping or money. There's so many things that it can be that we can end up putting before God. And it leads to what we call a posture problem. Last week, I, I talked about how if you look at the Sistine Chapel, if you look at the hand where God reaches out and Adam reaches out, that God is outstretched and Adam is kind of just hand limp. If you expand it out a little bit, and I, and I encourage you to, if you look, God is actually, his body is in a posture of reaching out and Adam is reclined and still can barely reach out his hand. And that's what happens with you and I. When we end up in a mess, we're not reaching out. We're not striving to find God in our lives. But the good news is, is that God still reaches out even in the midst of you and I messing things up. In the United Methodist Church, we believe in universal grace. Every 
everybody gets grace. We call it prevenient grace. It's this grace that you need even before you know who God is. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said, God first loves us and manifests himself unto us. While we are yet far off, he calls us to himself and shines upon our hearts. Another theologian, Scott Jones, says, Provenient grace partially restores our human faculties so that we might be able to accept or reject saving grace. The theology of provenient grace allows us to affirm that all good gifts come from God, even the ability to accept or reject saving grace. You and I need grace to even figure out who God is. We need grace for God to show up in the midst of our mess. And so for us to better understand this idea of provenient grace, I want to use a story that most of us are probably familiar with. It comes from Luke 19. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for, I can't remember the rest. But I, I, I got people singing it for me right back here. I can never remember that song. But we know that Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector. He was the lowest of low. Nobody liked him. He took money for Rome and then he took money on top for himself. He was short, so he had short man syndrome too, probably. Zacchaeus was not liked at all. And so Zacchaeus decided he would climb up in a tree because he heard Jesus was coming. And so I want to talk about six ways that Provenia Grace can work and, and use the example of Zacchaeus and how it may affect us. The first is initiative. Provenia Grace provides initiative. Jesus is walking and he sees Zacchaeus up in the tree. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree because I'm going to dine with you tonight. He reaches out. He knows who Zacchaeus is. And listen, you and I don't understand the concept of somebody coming up to you and saying, by the way, I'm, I'm eating at your house tonight. I'm going to use the same example. Cindy Miller, I'm coming over to your house for supper tonight. What you cooking? Cindy again gave me the, yeah, right, you ain't coming to my house for supper tonight. <laughs> We don't do that. We don't invite ourselves over. But in this day, it is the most important honor that anyone can give, especially Jesus coming to town. People would have fought over where can Jesus go eat and stay. And so Jesus goes, Zacchaeus. And everybody had to be like, Jesus, you don't even have a clue who that is. Because if you did, there's no way in the world you go eat with him. Jesus knows exactly who he is. He knows who you and I are. He knows what messes we have. And still he reaches out and initiates with us grace. So there's initiation. There's timing. I don't know what was going on at Zacchaeus' point in life. But there was something that drove Zacchaeus in his life at this point. To climb up into a sycamore tree... My guess is he's probably hit about as low as he can get. Nobody likes him. He hears this guy's coming, so maybe if I can just get a glimpse of who Jesus is. But I can't, so I'm just going to climb up in this tree because climbing up in the tree is not really going to bring my status in society down. I'm pretty much as low as I can get. So I'll climb up in this tree. You see, God works timing with us. I remember when I was in college after my sophomore year, I, I had an experience over the summer and be, decided I wanted to get serious about faith. And so I went and I was back at Clemson and one of my friends invited me to FCA at Clemson. Now, I didn't know anything about FCA other than people would write FCA 919 Tillman Hall on every chalkboard and dry erase board in campus because they wanted to invite people. And I always thought that they were a little weird. And so somebody goes, Gene, I want you to come to FCA with me. And I'm like, okay. 
So it's in this auditorium. There's a stage down and the seats go up pretty steep. And I'm like, okay, if I go sit in the very top seat and be a good Methodist, sit at the very back, as far back as I can get, then maybe nobody will see me. So I went and I sat back and one of my friends went with me and we sat back there. And so I got finished. And I was like, you know, that wasn't bad. They're not as crazy as I thought they were. The next day I went into class. I can still remember the classroom, the seat. It was German three class. I had taken the first two semesters with pretty much the same group of people. And one of these girls came in and she sat down next to me and she said, Gene, did I see you at FCA last night? Yeah. She said, I can't believe it. I've been praying for you for two years now. I said, excuse me? She said, I've been praying God would do something in your life. You see, God continues to work things out. And if you and I look back on things, God places timing in our life. That moment changed me. That somebody who I didn't even really know about would pray for me and care that much. And what that leads to is relationships. God is seeking a relationship with Zacchaeus. Not kind of these on the surface relationships that are, are temporary. You know those kind of relationships. I got to go to the, the Clemson National Championship game in Tampa Bay when we played Alabama. And my brother said, I want you to come with us, but I don't have a ticket for you. I'm going to have to get you a ticket to sit by yourself. And I said, that's fine. I'm in the stadium. I don't care. Well, the only ticket he could find was in the middle of the Alabama section. So I got Alabama here, I got Alabama here, and I got Alabama here. And there's two open seats next to me, and I'm like, Lord, please don't put more Alabama around me. I'm going to be this little orange dot in the midst of all this crimson. Lo and behold, two Clemson people come and sit next to me. I couldn't tell you their names. I wouldn't know them if they walked in that back door. But let me tell you what, for four and a half hours, they were my best friends. We had a good relationship. We cheered together. We celebrated together. We hugged each other. And then it was over. That's not what Jesus is looking for with Zacchaeus. He says, Zacchaeus, I want to come and I want to have a meal with you. I mean, he could have walked by and he could have said, Zacchaeus, I see you up in that tree. Lord bless you. And he could have kept on going. But he said, no, Zacchaeus, I want to have a meal with you. I want to build this relationship. It's what Christ wants to do with us. It's a relationship to get to know us, to find out who we are. And after there's been this initiation and there's timing and this relationship, then we have these what we call aha moments. And I think I may have shared this aha moment with you before, but one day we were at my home church singing a hymn. I remember the pew we were sitting in. And as I'm singing, I looked down at the hymnal and I looked at my wife. I said, hey, baby. She said, what? I said, I just figured something out. She goes, what? I said, you see the lines where the music is? She goes, yes. My wife knows music, I don't. I said, when the notes like go physically up on the line, you sing higher, and when they come down, you sing lower. My wife had to excuse herself from the sanctuary so she did not fall on the ground laughing at me. It still doesn't help me sing, sorry. <laughs> I have one of those aha moments. We know those moments where something comes together, something pieces together for us. For Zacchaeus, this was it. This was the moment. Christ came. And something clicked for Zacchaeus, this person who wants to build a relationship with me, has given me this moment. And when we have those moments, it's a moment that we want to hold on to. It's a moment that we want to participate in. Because we fall in love with who Jesus is. And when we fall in love, we do crazy things. I mean, if you're honest about it, if you've ever dated somebody and you've been in love, you've done something crazy or dumb in your life. 
For our 10th anniversary, we were in Asheville, and Katie talks about this fast food restaurant that she, where she grew up in Kingsport called Pals. It's very limited in where it is, but it's this fast food restaurant, and all she talked about every month was Pals. About once a month, it was Pals, Pals, Pals. And so we're sitting there in Asheville, and we had a day off, and the closest Pals was in Irwin, Tennessee, about an hour away, and I said, okay, baby, I'll tell you what. Let's go to Pals. I know this wing won't be any closer again. Let's just go to Pals. It'll be a nice drive through the mountains. She said, okay. So we get in the car. We're on the way. I'm like, all right, great. We'll go. We'll, we'll go to Pals. We'll sit down and we'll eat. We'll check out Irwin, Tennessee. And then we'll come back. And she goes, oh, oh, honey. I said, what? She goes, you can't sit down at Pals. It's only drive through. <laughs> I said, wait, wait, wait. I'm driving an hour each way for a drive through fast food meal. And she goes, yeah. And? So we get to almost Irwin, Tennessee, and I realize, you know what? She loves Kingsport, has always wanted to show me Kingsport, and it's only another like 30 or 45 minutes down the road. So I drove three and a half hours to four hours round trip for a fast food meal for my wife. And you may be thinking to yourself, Gene, pals had to be great. It was fast food, people. <laughs> now, my wife is going to shoot me for that if she hears this recording. They have good sweet tea, but it's fast food. But we do crazy things when we're in love. And so Zacchaeus has this aha moment. He thinks, Jesus may be this guy that I've been looking for. This may be my way to get up off the bottom because he actually cares. He came and ate with me. Other people don't come and eat with me. Jesus came and ate with me. And so as he's telling me about himself and what God wants, Zacchaeus says, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to repay everybody that I took from and I'm going to double it. Jesus didn't ask him to do that. Zacchaeus is doing that because something has changed in him. Even in the midst of his mess, God has reached out to build a relationship with him at this time. And so out of that, he wants to participate. He wants to be part of what's going on. And after all of this, what God desires most in the last part of provenient grace is it builds community. God wants you and I to be the church together. It's about how we live together. No matter how big of a mess we're in, there is universal grace. So I want to encourage you this week. Notice the people around you, not just sitting in the pews today, but the people around you every day. God has given that person grace. Whether that person even knows who God is or even cares about God or has ever heard of church, God gives them grace. May we be that reflection for the community. We've talked about this 40 acts of worship that we're doing, 40 acts of generosity Monday through Saturday. I want to encourage you, if you haven't been a part of that yet, get on board. If you've been doing it, continue. There's more cards waiting for you in the back. Be that community. Reach out in grace. Be the people to help initiate. Because you very well may just be the person who is the help in initiating things. You may be the reflection of God that somebody needs. Because we all need grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 377, It Is Well With My Soul. Let us stand and sing together.
A reminder, if you need a book for Bible study, there should be a couple left back there. Uh, if there's not, let me know, and I will get some more. Uh, their cards are also back there for the 40 Acts of Generosity. Receive the benediction. Let us go forth from this place in the love of Christ to extend God's grace to all, because we all need grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.